Thank you for the opportunity of being with you today. We've had an exciting week where our theme has been people, I'm leaning this so you can see it, people are more precious than things. And, uh, you know, Jesus said that one person is worth the wealth of the whole world. So think about you, how valuable you are to God. Maybe you feel like your life isn't that valuable right now. Maybe you're going through all kinds of stuff, but you are precious to God, highly, highly valuable. And so uh, Megan Thurber and uh, Dean Morris, I almost forgot your name there, Dean, <laughs> is with me here on the set today. And we've had a good week, and I look forward to your comments as we've been teaching. But uh, we want to cover a lot of territory today, and we want to talk a lot about what, what's happening. Maybe before I do anything else, uh, no, let's go to the straight talk right now. Here it is, straight talk. Thank you so much for sending in your questions, and we encourage you to continue to email. You can see all the information at the bottom of the screen, and text your questions. So the first one today is coming from Yvette. I have a hard time participating in corporate worship. It just seems like a show. Do you have any advice? Yvette, I, 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 you have my full sympathy. <laughs> That's all I can say. And, and I see Dean smiling over there because you've heard me address this in my pastor seminar sometimes. And so I think we have to be careful that our worship is focused on Jesus Christ. And, and Yvette says here that it seems like a show, and it can become a show. It can become just a performance. It's all about how good the mics were working, how good the harmony was, how the mixing was, and how each one came across. But it's really, um, worship is supposed to be the whole body together uh, worshiping Christ. And um, so I, I, I sympathize with this. Uh, I try to look at it this way. I'm only in charge of one person. I'm in charge of myself. And so I don't have to evaluate and judge everybody else. And I might think, well, maybe this person is a bit showy. I don't have to assess that. I don't have to know who's putting on a show and who's not and who's in the flesh and who's in the spirit, so to speak, as some would express it. I am only responsible for me. And so I can say, Lord, I want to worship you today. I, I want to give you praise. I am thankful for what you've done to me. So I would give that advice. This focus is between you and the Lord. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, and, and people sing these songs that, that don't even glorify Christ at all. It's, it's more self-glorification. And then I change the words. I have been known uh, to be in a worship service and they are singing certain songs which I think are not scriptural and I just make up my own words and have a good time anyhow. And, and they don't even know it. I don't tell anybody I did it, except I'm telling you right now. But uh, I just make up my own words. Uh, you, you know, when they sing, these are the days of Elijah. I know these are not the days of Elijah. He's long gone. I sing, these are the days of the believer. These are the days of Christ and his believers. This is, this is the day of the gospel. So I just change it. I love the tune. And so uh, my advice is, it's between you and God. And, and we don't have to assess everybody else. Hope that helps. You can enjoy your Sunday morning service even more. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, next question from Sarah. I heard you say a study shows that 95% of those who start out in ministry in their 20s and 30s quit before 65. What is your key to longevity? Well, I, I think the study, maybe I said it in the wrong way. They, they quit or they somehow were sidetracked. Didn't cross the age 65, not that that is a finish line. I can't even imagine being that old, but if it was, you know, <laughs> uh, that, that, that is not it's a finish line. Uh, but I would say this, the most important for anybody, minister or anybody who's a Christian, is to be anchored in Christ. What I find sometimes in ministry, some people get caught up in a thing. It could be they get into a prophecy or into faith or into something else. They, 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 and, and that's all okay as long as you are balanced, anchored in Christ, so that your life, you could say, my life has been the story of growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I encountered Christ, I put my roots in Christ, and yes, different trends come, different things, but some people get into something and then they become disappointed. They start feeling empty inside. They feel like this is not what I started out with. And what's really happened, they drift from Christ. And so I think a key to longevity is to stay connected to Christ. I know that has been the truth for me. Uh, when, when different winds have come that made me say, I'm quitting, I'm giving up the whole thing. I don't give up because of Christ. He means too much to me. 
and I want to keep growing in the knowledge of Christ. So that's uh, what I would say to that person. You have one more question one today? One more. One more from Anna. Over the last year, the appearance of my niece has changed drastically to a heavy metal kind of gothic look. It disturbs me. Do you have any advice? Well, you know, relatives, family get disturbed <laughs> by family members maybe that seem to be struggling or trying to find themselves. And, and it doesn't have to be family, it could be any person. Let me tell you what I do. I, when I see something, you know, and, and I want to speak up right away. I want to kind of give my two cents or two dollars worth, whatever it is, and say, well, you, you know, well, what's going on? I think it's good to stand back and just love the person. You know, don't pay attention to things that look different on the outside. And then wait for the opportunity. And then, but don't say anything in the sense of, you know, I'm admonishing you. Ask question. You could say, well, hey, I noticed you changed your looks from a year ago. What's going on? What, what, you know, you like this look? What's going on? And then let them talk. Don't interrupt them. It's the same when I witness and share Christ with someone. Let them talk. Let them tell exactly what they're thinking. Because sooner or later, they're going to ask, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And then they have opened the door for you to enter in and share. They invited you in. And so that's what I would say. Love with the love of Christ as much as that person is ready to receive that. And then wait for the opportunity. But don't rush because our tendency is, oh, ooh, I, feel, I, I, said, I don't want her. I don't want him to hurt himself. I don't want him to hurt himself. I want, I want to fix everything. But that can actually bring a short circuiting. So, you know, God knows everything and he opens the doors. So those are good questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Megan. Well, thank you, the viewer. <laughs> Please continue to send in your questions. Uh, you can email, text your questions to us, and we will gladly ask Pastor Peter your questions. All right. Well, and we want to hear from you, your prayer request, anything else. And, of course, we are introducing my book, Great Wealth Transfer. And, uh, and uh, the, the wealth is people. And then God also promises, and we've looked at examples from Scripture, how in the time of when Israel came out of Egypt, they, they, it says they stripped the Egyptians. They took the wealth of Egypt. Was that fair? Well, fair or not fair? They had worked for 400 years, and they got paid up in one day. That's a pretty big wealth transfer. And, uh, and, and so I, this book, is, it says on the cover there, Ancient Prophecy Predicts. And let me just say, I'm... I'm we're talking about this now for quite a number of programs. I haven't even talked about that ancient prophecy. But here's what, what it said in the prophecy, 2,500-year-old prophecy. God will shake all nations. It's from the prophet Haggai. God will shake all nations. And it says the wealth of the nations will come into the temple of God. I'll read it to you in the Bible in a moment. And it says all silver, gold, and money belongs to God. That, that is really something if you think about that. And then Haggai said that there's a final temple coming and its glory will be vastly greater than any previous temple. And then here's the key thing. God always provides for the building of his dwelling place. When they built uh, the, the tabernacle, slaves without money, God provided for them to do it. When the temple had to be built, Israel was a poor country, but through David's reign, it was transformed in a wealth transfer so they could do it. Now we are building God's eternal temple of living stones. And, and, and certainly God will provide. You see, to build a temple of living stone is another way to describe world evangelization. The gospel is preached. People respond, and with each response, there's another, quote-unquote, stone added to the temple. Every person who comes to faith in Christ becomes a living stone. In the cases of the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon, God gave specific and detailed instruction about what he wanted. And if God was so particular in regards to his temporary dwelling places, how much more particular for his eternal temple, which is you? For starters, there's no gender or ethnicity that receives preferential treatment. God wants everyone represented. Look at the prophecy uh, that John wrote. He said, I, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue standing before the throne and before the Lamb. John saw every people group in the world represented. This means that the assignment that Christ gave to the church will succeed. Our cause, the gospel cause, will win. You see, the temple of living stones consists of people of every tribe, nation, and ethnicity. 
you know, physical building programs, they can generate great excitement. Sometimes donors receive a plaque with their name engraved, depending on the size of the gift. But I'm addressing something very different from a massive superdome church building, though large buildings can be useful. I'm talking about a spiritual structure, an eternal temple of living stones, infinitely more valuable than any physical building program. I tell you, I'm getting excited talking about that. Jesus said one person is worth more than the wealth of every physical structure ever erected. If God provided finances, for the tabernacle and the temple, how much more majestic and extravagant will not be God's provision for his ultimate eternal dwelling place? It took money, a lot of money, to build God's temporary dwelling places as described you know, in, in this program. And it's going to take money, lots of money, for God's glorious last temple. Haggai prophesied. Let me read the prophecy again. Take it a little slower this time. The Lord of hosts says, yet once in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Now the book of Hebrews, I think I commented on this yesterday, interprets Haggai's prophecy and makes it clear that those specific words, I will shake all nations, are connected to the new covenant provided through Christ. And it says in the book of Hebrews, the removing of those things which can be shaken as some created things so that those things which may, cannot be shaken may remain. I, I mean, we don't have to guess what Haggai is talking about. All those, even the temple itself and all the stuff there, it was shaken and destroyed. Not one stone was left on the other. So what is Haggai talking about? Religious systems, the whole religious system of Moses was shaken by the gospel. And this is in line with the message of the book of Hebrews. Or, you know, so we can say that Haggai's prophecy is about religious structures which are shaken to the core by the gospel. Now, Haggai, this prophet from two and a half millennia ago, he looked beyond the Jewish nation and he saw God's global plan. Every kingdom, every religious structure, every knee shall bow to Christ. All things will ultimately be put under Christ's feet. And then he says this, pay attention. I will shake all nations and they will come with the wealth of all nations. So this transfer of wealth, they will come with the wealth of all nations is like unlike anything ever seen. All nations, think about it, will come with their wealth. It's staggering. Now look at the sequence of events here. First, the gospel, the good news of Christ's kingdom will shake every shakeable structure of religion. Religion is going down. And second, on the heels of this spiritual shaking, there is a financial wealth transfer. It says all nations will come with their wealth. Other translation says the precious things of all nations shall come or the treasures of all nations shall come. However you look at it, you can look and read any Bible translation, however you look at it. Riches and wealth of the world is made available for God's purposes. It's clear that the church in the book of Acts enjoyed such provision. You know, the idea that the apostles were akin to poor monks begging for bread is not in line with the scripture. When the Roman governor Felix kept Paul the apostle in prison, here's what we read. At the same time, the governor was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send it to him quite often and converse with him. Think about that. Think about that. Why would a Roman governor with access to the spoils of war and taxation money and why was he hoping to receive money from Paul? Well, obviously he realized that Paul had access to money. He was not a poor uh, monk begging for bread. And I'm saying to you, if that first generation of gospel carries in the book of, Act, book of Acts tapped into the fulfillment of Haggai's prophecy, how much more for us today? We have almost 8 billion people on planet Earth. Every one of them. Jesus died for them. His blood was shed for them. You know, the temple that Haggai described had a glory that exceeded any previous temple. Certainly billions. I'm, I'm, I didn't say millions. I said billions of precious people of all tribes, nations, and languages. Each one a living stone filled with the Spirit of God is far more beautiful than the most majestic cathedral 
the most majestic temple or palace. You know, Haggai says, I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. Well, the Hebrew word for glory is kavod. It means something weighty. And, and, and what is more weighty than people that have been transformed? But here's what I want you to catch. In Haggai's prophecy, the word glory includes money. Because it says in the very next sentence, the silver and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. God's glory is the silver and the gold that will fill God's dwelling place. Now remember, silver in Hebrew is the same word as money, kesef. So God says, the money is mine, the gold is mine. All money ultimately belongs to God and His purposes. Think about that. God is the rightful owner of everything through creation and through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Everything that is on the earth, including all wealth, ultimately belongs to Jesus Christ. And so Haggai says, something is going to happen. This final temple, this temple I say of living stones that Stephen talked about when he was martyred, and Simon Peter talked about it, and Paul talked about it, and Jesus talked about it, and John wrote about it in the book of Revelation. This temple where believers are pillars in the temple of God, and that temple is going to experience that the wealth of the nations will come into it. We don't ask God to bless what we want to do. We get involved with what God is doing. Haggai continues, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. Think about this. So whatever this temple is of living stones, it is a place where God will give peace. Well, number one, Christ is the Prince of Peace. So think about that. There's no peace without Jesus Christ. Christ's gospel is the gospel of peace. Uh, that's something to think about, that when we come to people, we don't come with a war like you're, we don't come to hit them in the head with the Bible. We come with the good news of peace. Blessed are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace to the world. I tell you, something is about to happen. And I believe the areas of the world, I'm talking about Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim. You can see maybe, maybe in the control room if they're following with me. Show some of the pictures of our campaigns there. I mean, we, we're reaching out. There's a Muslim city. There's a, there's a city with a lot of Muslims. There's a, another Muslim area. Uh, you can see this is, in, well, that's in South America. Uh, and, and we have from New Delhi among Hindus there. Uh, great stadiums all over the world where we've had these meetings. Well, what's happening is uh, we, we are, we are, we are we're taking finances which is a tiny thing in the whole picture. It's a little wealth. And we're saying we're making friends for eternity. The real wealth is people. But Haggai's prophecy has a little warning in it. He says, you have sown much, but you harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's enough, not, to, not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but nobody is warm. And he who earns, earns wages to put in a purse with holes. He says... You know, get aligned with God's purpose. Well, you can be doing all this effort, but it's just like putting the money in, in, in a wallet with a hole in it. You keep losing it. And so I'm saying to you, I, I, I hope that you will get a hold of this. I just spoke kind of fast. I wanted to get some thoughts across to you. And they're helping me by putting those graphics on the bottom there because I want the whole screen to be preaching at you. You hear my words and then you, your eyes are active. You're seeing the graphics right there. Something is happening. Get aligned with it. We believe that the earth is the Lord's. And, and rather than having to say, God, help me. God, give me money. Align yourself with God's purposes because God will provide for that which he is in charge of. And I tell you, something powerful is happening. I, I watch the video where I explain a little bit uh, about what this prophecy is about. Watch this. An ancient prophecy foretells an unprecedented global event. In his book, Great Wealth Transfer, Dr. Peter Youngward unveils the hidden gems of this prophecy. There are two kinds of wealth, people and finances. By far the greatest is people. People are always more valuable than things. Jesus said that even one person is worth the wealth of the universe. And this wealth, people, will experience an unprecedented transfer from spiritual darkness to the light of Jesus Christ. There is also a lesser wealth, 
finances. The ancient prophecy speaks of the wealth of all nations reassigned for God's purpose. Discover the profound meaning of this 2,500 years old prophecy. Glean life-changing principles from three wealth transfers. Two are past and one is now. Learn nine powerful benefits of the gospel. Learn how first century believers handled finances, what it means today. Study the correlation between a global spiritual awakening and God's abundance. Discover the power of the alignment between God's purposes and yours. For a limited time, this one-of-a-kind hardcover book, normally $22 plus shipping and handling, is available for shipping and handling of $7 only. Order now at peteryoungren.org slash book offer or call 416-745-1820. You know, when you write a book like I published this book, by the way, it's a hardcover book. Why do you write a book? Well, I write it because I think I have something to say. And in this case, that the body of Christ, the believers haven't heard. And of course, it's rooted in the Bible. It may have been preached and shared, but I haven't seen it in book form. I'm not copying what somebody else wrote about I am sharing something that I think can have a drastic effect and a sense of purpose and a sense of increase in your life. And so order this, and I've given you a little bit of an appetizer of it. There's so much more in the book, and you will can read it slowly and take notes as people do in my book. So go ahead and get a hold of that, share it with a friend, and, 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 and uncover that ancient prophecy. And uh, and so as I was talking about this, I saw you, uh, Dean, there at some point. I could see you out of the corner of my eye. You Something was igniting or you had a thought or something. So I don't know what it is, but go ahead and share it. You know, I hope it's okay to make a confession here on the program today. Spill all your sins. But, lay them out here. <laughs> but as you were talking about that prophecy in Haggai that talks about earning money and putting it in pockets with holes, I can say that I had done that for many, many years. And uh, I, I'm not proud of it. And, uh, you know, giving into different things that I thought were the gospel, or I thought were building, you know, what Jesus had intended. But, but it really was nothing but putting a lot of money in a lot of holes. And so I can say that this morning, actually before, uh, you know, the program, I actually finished the book uh, at home. And it's so much of what you've taught me over the years. And it's the importance of, of, of really... Uh, getting in line with God's purpose and putting the, the you know money into the gospel, and uh, it's so much of what you taught me and uh, and those one-on-one -on -one sessions or or overseas is, yeah. is found right here in this book. You know, I was thinking here because we just touched a little bit here and there, but it's one of the chapters here. I, uh, let me see if I can find it. It's chapter three, I think it is, called a new perspective on money. Because yep. people expect, you know, when you hear a preacher. And people would say this to me, oh, you're a prosperity preacher. Of course, I believe God meets our needs. Tyna was here the other day on the program, and she talked about how, how God has met her needs, and she's seen God do great things. And then we often talk, because I want people to know, we, 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 we just pray and ask God to help us. I know you and Nathan do that. In mm -hmm. fact, we, we're close as, you know, not just on the set, but we're close friends, and so we know that. What you believe in God for, we believe in with you. But what I want people to say, and that's important. You know, not a sparrow falls to the ground that, that our, our Lord doesn't know about it. So whatever the smallest need you have, people sometimes say, can you pray for this? It's just a small thing. I almost feel ridiculous to mention it. Stop. Don't feel ridiculous to mention it. The smallest thing, the minutest thing. And, and, and so that's beautiful. There's a lot of teaching on, you know, God meeting your needs. And all. That, that is wonderful. But I'm taking it to another dimension in this book. I'm saying... Yes, that is still there. But I'm talking about a global alignment and, and a spiritual awakening, but also something that happens in the financial world. You know, I, I thought about it in, in 2020, uh, 2019, the stock market in the United States alone went up 17 trillion, I read. You know, by March 2020, they lost it all and more. Money's changing hands. I mean, if anybody doubts living in our world that money is changing hands, uh, it can change hands quickly. And I believe more money will come into the hands of people who are dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so go ahead and get that whole thing. We're not going to talk about it so much anymore, but, but go ahead and get that. I want to also say to you, 
If you didn't get our last update here, let's put it right now. Our Hindi campaign has gone over 18 million. Uh, you know, we're, we're reaching out to language group. Look at that, over 18 million reached. And, and we keep a tally. You can do that through social media. Dean is my guy to do it. Do you see that? Eight, put it back there again for just a second. 831,363 individuals participated in the whole campaign. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? You can, you can go to me now again. Everybody saw that. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm making a point of gesturing. Uh, they, they, they saw the whole campaign. I'm thinking to myself, here we have been in a lockdown, and we had a meeting in the Hindi language with 800 and, what was it, 831,363 individuals in a meeting. That's a pretty good gospel meeting. And then we had a campaign to a much smaller language group, the Swahili-speaking group, and their numbers have shot up since last week. We kind of look at this once a week. Um, well over three and a half million, well over a quarter of a million people who have been participating in the whole campaign. These, and now we're reaching out in the Tamil language, big language in, in Sri Lanka, southern India, all over the world. Many of the people are Muslims. So, uh, most of them are Hindus probably, actually. Hindus, Muslims and some Buddhist, and, and, and so you are helping make this possible. And I say a big thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no greater joy than to invest in the gospel. And sometimes when I get overwhelmed by it all, God reminds me that he has always met my need before. You know, sometimes that's why we take the communion to remember. So sometimes when I'm looking at a financial challenge or any other challenge, God, remember, remember remember back there how I help you. I will help you again. Let's pray together right now. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for your love for every person watching. I thank you for healing. I thank you for help. I thank you for encouragement. I thank you for people who maybe have been feeling like they lack purpose. I thank you that they're being refreshed and renewed. I thank you for healing heart conditions and kidney problems and respiratory organs being healed. We receive healing in the name of Jesus. And then if you don't know Christ as your Savior, let me say in the closing seconds, uh, please ask for the material. You'll see it there on the screen. Just text me. You can text me your prayer request. Text that request as well. Text to receive our magazine. You see the text number. You'll notice that. And you can call the prayer center as well, of course. Well, I'm talking as fast as I can, but I'm running out of time. It's been wonderful to be with you. Be encouraged. And remember, you are loved. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A2W1 or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.